you. Take God's word, please, this morning and open to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm not going to ask you to stand today, um, but I do want you to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 10 here today. Lord willing, we'll get through these verses. And I want to just read one verse with you before we begin. In verse 1 of chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, your word is so rich and wonderful. And Lord, we need to understand it, and we can't do that on our own. So we need your help. And so, Lord, help us today. Help us to be attentive. Help us to realize how important it is that we, we hear the Scripture, because through the Scripture, Lord, you speak to your church. And so speak to our hearts today and help me, your servant, to make your word clear for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You all have heard me talk about my uh, father and the conversion of my father several times. We came here to Grace many years ago when Pastor Johnson was preaching the Word of God, and he heard Pastor Johnson's powerful preaching of the gospel, and he uh, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. That was a turning point in the life of my family. And over the years, I've learned more and more how valuable God's grace truly is. God's grace to me is the most precious gift that anyone could ever receive. It's the most precious thing that could ever happen. And when we talk about the grace of God, we're talking about God's love in the gospel. We're talking about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming and dying for our sins, being our substitute, bearing our sin debt, uh, giving us eternal life when we put our faith in him. But it goes even beyond that. It, it's all about God seeking me in salvation. God seeing me as a wretched sinner, God loving me, God pursuing me because as a sinner, I would never seek him. He had to seek me. The Bible says in Psalm 14, verse 1, that the Lord looked down, verse 2 rather, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there was any that did seek God. God, in case you have ever wondering whether or not people seek God, the Bible makes it clear for us. God looked down from heaven to see if anyone was seeking God. And by the way, where it says he looked upon the children of men, the literal Hebrew there is kol b'nei Adam, all the sons of Adam. That's everybody. Here's God looking through the telescope of time, seeing if there were anyone that did seek him. And what was the conclusion of that? The Bible tells us in Psalm 14, verse 3, they're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There's none that do it good. No, not one. And when the apostle Paul was talking about human depravity and our need for the gospel in Romans chapter 3, he quotes from Psalm 14, and he says, quoting from Psalm 14, there's none that seek after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that do it good, no, not one. Therefore, it has to be God seeking me. God is the one who took the initiative. He sought me out. I didn't seek him. We love him because he first loved us, right? And so it was the initiative of God. Now, Paul understood the grace of God better than anyone. He was not seeking God on the road to Damascus. He wasn't going to a revival meeting. The only thing he was seeking was more Christians to persecute. He was seeking more Christians to throw in jail. He hated Christianity. He hated the message of Christ. He hated Christ himself until he met Jesus Christ face to face on the road to Damascus, and his life was radically changed by the grace of God. And then Paul would later write in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, and I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Exceedingly abundantly means over, over and above all. His grace was over and above. It was extraordinary. Paul understood how precious God's grace was in his life, that God would reach out to him in his grace. And he later wrote this, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. See anything good in me? I guarantee it's the grace of God. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, because I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul valued God's grace so much that he determined that the grace that God bestowed in his life would not be in vain. That investment that God made in the life of Paul, 
Paul determined would reap eternal reward, eternal dividends. Paul determined to value and cherish the grace of God that was given to him. He would never take God's grace for granted. And no one was more dedicated than Paul. I think there's a danger in the life of Christians, that is that we, we don't cherish God's grace in our life. We don't cherish what God has given us in Christ. And therefore, we don't worship the Lord the way we should. We don't serve the Lord the way we should because we don't treasure grace. And Paul feared that this was happening among the Corinthians. This was his fear. And this is why he starts out again in verse number one. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. The word beseech here, parakaleo, to come along and urge and beg. Paul saying, look, I, I'm begging you. It's present tense. I, I'm, I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Don't let whatever grace you've been showed in hearing the gospel and hearing about the mercy of God, don't let any of that be in vain in your life. Now, remember the context of this. Paul was being viciously attacked by these Corinthians. Some of the false teachers had come in and they had questioned his credibility, his character. They had questioned the message that he was preaching. And because of that, Many people in the church of Corinth began to separate from Paul because they questioned his credibility. If someone came in and started criticizing me and saying, oh, he's not legit, be careful, he's preaching a false gospel, and, and people started questioning my credibility, you wouldn't listen to me anymore if you believe them. That was what was happening with Paul. And Paul was trying to defend himself. And he has been, we spent the first four chapters defending his character and his credibility and, and his preaching of the beautiful, glorious gospel, that new covenant message, which is so far more glorious than the old covenant message. And now he's pleading with reconciliation to the Corinthians. Look in verse number 11 of chapter 6. Notice what he says there in verse 11 of chapter 6. He says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you and our heart is enlarged. And ye are not straightened in us. The word straightened here means restricted. But ye are a straightened in your own bowels, or that is affections. What Paul is saying is, look, I haven't withheld my affection from you. I haven't withheld my love for you. But you have withheld your affection from me. And now I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you that we be reconciled, that you believe me, that you trust what I preach. I mean, this whole passage is Paul pleading with the Corinthians to be reconciled with him and that they lay hold of the gospel that Paul had preached to them, that pure gospel, and that they be a partner with him to help get that pure gospel message out. And in doing so, he's warning them, you are taking the grace of God, and there's the potential of you receiving it in vain. Don't do that. How can believers receive God's grace in vain? How can we do that? Let me give you four ways. This is what Paul teaches us here. And there's four ways that we receive God's grace in vain. Here's the first way. Number one, failing to serve our Savior. Look again in verse number one. We then, as workers together with him. Workers together comes from one Greek word, soon or jeo. Soon with or jeo, where we get the word energy. Working with who are we working with? We're working with our Savior, Jesus Christ. It says with him. Now, that's italicized in the uh, King James, which means they kind of added that on, and the, but it's, it's a correct thing to put with him because it is playing on the previous verse. Look at verse 21 of chapter 5. Just back up at the verse right above it. For he hath made himself to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And therefore, because of that, we then as workers together with him. It's talking about Christ. You understand that when the grace of God comes and saves you, you get the incredible, unique, wonderful privilege to work together with Christ, your Savior. That's the whole point there. That's the him. This is an incredible privilege. I feel incredible privilege that I who am a nobody, gets to stand up and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And that's all because of the grace of God saving an unworthy sinner. I get to work with him. That's, that's an unspeakable privilege. 
And Paul recognized that privilege. In Ephesians 3, 7, he said, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which works in me, which was given me by the working of his power. That same grace that saved Paul is the grace that helps him to do the things that God called him to do. What an incredible, incredible honor that is to serve the Lord. You understand you were served, or excuse me, you were saved to serve him. And, and, and if you have the grace of God in your life and you're not doing anything about that, that grace is in vain. And Paul determined God's grace that was invested in me is not going to be in vain. I'm going to serve, I'm going to labor more diligently. I'm going to serve. You know, sometimes we ask someone to help out in an area and they'll say, well, you know, I'm just not comfortable with doing that. What has your comfort got to do with anything? I mean, really? Are you, you only want to do the things that are comfortable? That's what our society has gotten to, I guess, today. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't say that to the Father. Um, you know, Father, I'm thinking about this crucifixion thing. I'm just not comfortable with it. I'm not experiencing crucifixion. No. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And so he saved us so that we could be workers together. And when we don't serve our Lord who saved us, God's grace is received in vain. I see the parallel in Romans 12.1. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Because Jesus gave himself for you, can you not give yourself back to your Lord? And so we can receive God's grace in vain by failing to serve him. But here's number two. By failing to understand the urgency of salvation, look at verse number two. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time acceptable, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. One sure way to receive God's grace in vain is to disbelieve the message of the gospel or to fail to respond to that message with urgency, with earnestness, when God in his grace seeks you out and presents you with the gospel, you better respond to it. And you better respond with urgency. And you better make sure of your soul. You better make sure of your salvation. Don't play with that. Don't take it for granted. Paul was very concerned about the Corinthians because the false teachers had come in and they began to sow seeds of doubt. They began to preach another gospel. And they denied Paul's message that the righteousness of God was obtained by faith. Because of that, some of the Corinthians were beginning to falter, and Paul was afraid of that. Now, Paul didn't believe that true believers can lose their salvation. And by the way, if you're truly saved and you know Jesus, you're secure. You're not going to lose it. He that begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. But the question is, do you have the real thing? And Paul was not convinced that everyone in Corinth was a true believer. And it was up to the believer to make certain that their faith was genuine. That's why he would write later on in the same letter, in chapter 13, verse number 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Christ Jesus is in you, except you be reprobates. And one of the evidences of true salvation is, you embrace this gospel, and you don't let it go, and you hold on to it, and you don't let anything remove you from it. You continue to believe. And so Paul warned about these false teachers that were luring people away from the true gospel. Look in 2 Corinthians, look in chapter 11, look at verse number 3. Just flip over there a few pages. 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 3. Paul says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And so Paul was very concerned about some of the believers there, or so who, those who profess to be saved, were beginning to hold on to another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. And so this was an urgent matter. 
Salvation is an urgent matter. That's why, go back to chapter 6 and look at verse number 2. What Paul's doing here is he's quoting from the Old Testament, Isaiah 49, 8. In Isaiah 49, 8, it says this, Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day, <coughs> excuse me, in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of, to the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. In other words, what Isaiah was doing was Isaiah in the Old Testament was prophesying of a time when God would make salvation available to all, not just Jews but Gentiles. The message of salvation would be available to all. He's saying there's coming a time of grace. There's coming an age of salvation and grace. And Paul picked up that Old Testament passage and he says, guess what, Corinthians? Now is the time. It's right now. That time that Isaiah talked about, that day of grace, we're living in it right now. You understand that right now God offers you grace? God offers you salvation? But don't think upon that lightly because that window could close. It could close any moment. It could close. You don't know when your last opportunity will be to make sure of your soul. So you better take care of it now. Now is the accepted time. Right now is the day of salvation. You understand life is fragile, right? I mean, we saw that this week. Anybody see the football player on the field? His heart stopped, and everybody was watching that. And, it's, and I've been watching the reaction, and I prayed for that young man, prayed for his mother, and, and thank God it looks like he's going to be okay. But you know what? It, it, now we have football players kneeling on the football field praying and thinking about God like they never did because one lesson we learn from all of that is how fragile life is. And in one moment it could all be over, and you breathe your last breath, and the... The day of grace is gone. It's over with. Now is the time. You better get that settled. I was this week praying with one of our senior saints, a wonderful man, and he got up one morning and found his son had passed away, just 45 years old, just, just, just unexpected, just passed away. Friend, we don't know when our last opportunity will be. We better not procrastinate. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians here, look, you better stop playing around with this message of the gospel, and you better believe it. You better understand how precious it is. You better lay hold of it, and you better make sure of your soul. Now, do it now. Don't put it off. Make sure you know him. How can believers receive God's grace in vain? By failing to serve our Lord, by failing to understand the urgency of salvation. But here's number three, by failing to live a life of integrity. Look at verse number 3 of chapter 6. Notice what Paul says here. He says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. And what Paul is saying is he was careful and determined by the grace of God not to allow any stain upon the ministry because of his life. He didn't want anyone stumbling over the gospel because of the way that he lived. Giving none offense is a very strong term. The negative here, no, not at all is the idea here in the Greek followed up by another negative term, not anything. No, not at all, not anything. That leaves room for nothing. Paul said, I don't want to bring an offense to cause to stumble in anything in my life. I don't want anyone to look at me and see any area of inconsistency or hypocrisy that would cause disgrace upon the name of Christ and would cause other people to stumble over the gospel. You understand that in order for the church to effectively evangelize, that what the world needs to see in the church are people who are real. They need to see people that walk with the Lord. We have heard of high-profile ministries and ministers that have fallen in scandal. Every time that happens, it creates a stumbling block for the gospel. And I don't have to go through the list of names of pastors and ministries and so on where there's been financial fraud or sexual immorality. By the way, the media loves to grab those stories and run with them, almost to hold it up to the world as if to say, see, it's not real. And the devil wants to use that to set up a stumbling block. And so Paul was determined that in his life, there wouldn't be anything in his life that would cause others to blaspheme Christ or to say it's not real. 
any believer that's not living up to what God has called them to live up to is failing of the grace of God. And so, and by the way, remember the, the Corinthians, they accused Paul of having a secret life. They said, you know, but he's not real. He's got a life of hidden shame. Uh, he's got secret sins in his life. Go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 4, um, excuse me, chapter 4, verse number 2. Notice what Paul said in 4.2. He said, but having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, nor walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul said, look, I don't have a hidden life. I live a life of integrity. I've renounced the hidden things. My conscience bears me witness. My conscience is clean. I've won the battle on the inside. I know that I'm living a life of integrity before God. And I do that, that the ministry, again in chapter 6, verse 3, that the ministry be not blamed. And the word there means discredited. I don't want to do anything that will discredit the gospel or discredit the ministry. And so I'm striving for integrity. So we, we can receive God's grace in vain by failing to serve our Savior, by failing to understand the urgency of salvation, by failing to live a life of integrity. But here's the last thing. We can receive God's grace in vain by failing to persevere in difficulty. Look in verse 4 of chapter 6. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God. The word approving means basically uh, commending or the word here, sinistamai, means to know something by action. In other words, Paul says, you can look at my life. Look at my life and see if I'm not approved of God. Watch what I do. That's the idea of the word here, to cause to know by watching actions. Paul said, watch my life. You want to know if I'm authentic? You want to know if I'm credible? You know what makes a credible minister or a credible servant of God? It's not seminary degrees. It's not success as the world sees success. It's how much can you continue to persevere for the gospel in your faith, even though difficulty comes. It's how many times can you get back up after you've been knocked down and just continue on. And Paul here is using himself as an example, saying, look, if you want to know whether or not I'm legitimate, whether I'm authentic, whether I'm real, just look at what I've gone through. And I'm still here. I haven't run from the battlefield. I haven't left. I'm still continuing on. That's the way you determine whether a person is truly of the Lord. You know, for over 40 years, God gave this church a, a godly pastor who persevered through all kind of difficulty, who started this church and took on the challenges and suffered himself and continue to be faithful to Jesus Christ. And you know what? His life is a legacy that all of us need to follow, to be faithful. And by the way, Mrs. Johnson is right there in that legacy too. The spiritual mother of grace, I call her. Her faithfulness is evident as well. And we need to follow that. We need to follow that kind of example. And this is what Paul's saying here. And what he does here, and we don't have time to go through all this, but from verse 4 on down to verse 10, what he gives us is a list of all the things that he has endured. And I'm telling you, it's exhausting just reading this. All the things he's had to go through. And, and basically, I can just kind of divide this up into three groups here. Um, you know, when he talks about impatience, his, um, his perseverance... Um, Basically, I see it in three different groups. A true minister is revealed by the pain he endures, by the purity he exemplifies, and then by the paradoxes he encounters. And so, first of all, the pain he endures. Look at verse 4. Again, in much patience, that's um, just being faithful. In verse number 4, uh, in much patience, in afflictions, that refers to emotional Distress, physical distress, necessities, that means hardship, distresses, literally being confined into a narrow space. He's talking about trials there from which there seemed to be no escape. Verse number five, stripes, that means he was beaten 
with fists and rods and whips, if you look at his life. Imprisonment, Paul was no stranger of prison. He had a good prison ministry. Tumults, that's riots, mob violence, civil disturbances. Some places Paul went and preached, it would bring a riot. Labors, that is the idea of working to the point of exhaustion, verse 5. Watchings, that's sleepless nights. Fasting, that means hungry. Uh, to be hungry, that's an involuntary fast, by the way. There's just nothing to eat. And then, so that's, first of all, that's one area. He endured pain, and then he exemplified purity. Look at verse 6. By pureness, he lived a pure life. By knowledge, I mean, the divine knowledge that Paul was given was inc incredible when you read his epistles. By long-suffering, that's patience with people and circumstances. By kindness, Paul was kind despite the fact that he was treated rudely by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave him the strength to endure by love unfeigned. That's a non-hypocritical love. He truly loved God's people. Verse 7, by the word of truth, that is the word of God. Paul loved God's word. It was his strength. And then by the power of God, Paul didn't depend upon his own cleverness. He depended upon God's power for ministry by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Paul learned how to draw on the strength and resources of God in his life. Finally, by encountering paradoxes. You know, those who preach the gospel are both loved and despised at the same time. I mean, some places I go to preach, I don't know whether to reach out my hand to shake someone's hand or to duck. Sometimes I get a little bit, a little bit of both. In this section, Paul is talking about the paradoxical character of ministry. He gives kind of a series of contrasts here in, in verse number um, Eighty says, by honor and dishonor. That is, there are some people that honor him, some that dishonor him. By evil report and good report, some give an evil report about him, some are good as deceivers and yet true. Some call him a deceiver. Some say he's a true servant of the Lord. Verse number 9, unknown yet well-known. In his early years, he was well-known to the Jewish elite, but after that, after he came to know Christ, they forgot him. But those who knew Christ knew him. And I think the implication here is it really doesn't matter what others know or don't know about me as long as I'm faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say here in verse number 10, notice, as sorrowful, actually um, back up to verse 9 where he says, as dying and behold we live. Paul was constantly facing a threat of death and yet the Lord helped him through all of that. Chastened and not killed. In verse 10, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, even though I have a lot of sorrow in my life, deep down underneath there's joy that carries me through the sorrows that I have to go through in ministry. As poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. I might not have a lot of this world's goods, but I'm rich. I don't have a lot of what the world has, but I have everything because I have Christ. And all these paradoxes, Paul's presenting to say, look, I understand what true riches are really about. It's the grace of God in my life. It was God's grace that carried me through all of these things. And so by failing to persevere through difficulty, we receive God's grace in vain. So let me just say this, friend. Do you really, really comprehend how precious God's grace is? You understand how wonderful that is? that you've been a recipient of this grace. Don't receive it in vain. Don't receive it in vain. Serve your Savior. Make sure of your soul. Grab on to this salvation. Make it known unto others. Live a life of integrity. And persevere through the difficulties. Show the world that God's grace is worth it. When I, sometimes I go over to London to visit my daughter and my son-in-law, my grandchildren. I like to go to some of these places that have some Christian historical value. And one of the places I love to visit is St. Mary's Church of Woolnoth there in London, where John Newton was the pastor. He is the one that wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. And as you go into that sanctuary, that church, you kind of look to the left-hand side. There's a big, beautiful plaque on the wall, kind of in the shape of an anchor, and it's dedicated to him. And this is what it reads. John Newton, once a slave trader and servant of slaves in Africa, 
was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith that he had long labored to destroy. Incredible testimony to him. Did you know that when John Newton was a little boy, his mother was a Christian? And she, she shared the gospel with him. She shared the word of God with him. But as he grew up, he turned away from what he had heard. And many people thought that the grace of God was bestowed upon him in vain. And one day, while he was on board a ship as a sailor, when a vicious storm came and threatened to sink the boat, he was in the bottom of that ship kind of trying to pump out the water, fearing for his life. All of a sudden, he remembered in his mind the message of grace that his mother had taught him as a child. And he reached out in true repentance and faith, cried out to the Lord for mercy for God to save him, and God did save him. And later, of course, he wrote the song that we love to sing. But the one line of the song that I think about is that one line where he said, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed? How precious. And that whole hymn was about how precious God's grace is. Friend, is it precious to you? But don't let it be bestowed upon you in vain. Let's, let's bow for prayer together. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we thank you again with all of our heart for your wonderful grace in our life. It's beyond description. We don't have the words to convey the thanks that we owe you for loving us, for seeking us out, for giving us your grace, saving us, drawing us unto yourself. But Lord, I come before you today, and I, my prayer is, Lord, I don't want your grace to be in vain in my life. Lord, would you help me, please? Help me to serve you faithfully. Help me, Lord, to convey the message of salvation urgently to people, Lord, to let them see that this is the pearl of great price. This is the hidden treasure in a field. This is the thing that we should be willing to give up everything for. It's so precious. It's so wonderful. Help me, Lord, to embrace it with all my heart and to live a life of integrity in a sinful world, to show the world what your grace can do in the heart of an unworthy sinner. Lord, would you help me to be faithful in the battle and not run from the battlefield? But, Lord, to persevere no matter what may come. Lord, please help me to live in a way as to never allow your grace to be given to me in vain. And Father, I pray this for my own soul, and I pray this, Lord, for the souls of all of those who are here today who know you, that, Lord, you'd help us to be all that you called us to be. May we never forget and with heads bowed and eyes closed, I would just ask you here today, again, one of the points of my sermon is to make sure of your soul, beloved. I can't bear the thought of anyone under the sound of my voice dying without Jesus Christ, dying and going to a place called hell. I can't bear that thought. And I'm calling upon you to examine your heart to make sure that you know Christ that all of your faith and all of your hope is in his finished work. And, and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. Father, bless these words here today to every hearing heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name.